Welcome. Thank you so much for attending with us tonight. I am uh, Meg Guerrera. I am the, the chairperson of the High School Building Committee. Tonight, I will be joined up here for presentation with Kat Pajewski, who is our assistant town manager, and Kathy Greeter, our superintendent. But I also want to make sure that uh, we recognize that we have many of our building committee members with us here tonight, as well as online. So we have a good representation of all the people that are working very diligently on this project. So what we hope to do tonight is give you some high level updates on the project and the status today. Uh, it's going to very much align with the newsletter that hopefully you did receive in your mailbox. It went to everybody in town and that was kind of a good level set. We're gonna provide a little more context around some of those um, pieces of information and then open it up for questions and answers when we're all done. Make sense? Excellent. All right. So again, just a list of our committee members. Um, and as I said, there are several here with us this evening, but these are all people who are available to you. We have both voting members and our non-voting members listed here. And uh, you know, a large group of people representing both the community partners, our district, our town to help us kind of move this project forward and make sure we have all our stakeholders represented and aligned around our goals for the project. So what we want to do is just kind of quickly run through the timeline. And this is something that should be very familiar to everybody. This is a, the timeline we have been communicating at the time of referendum and beyond. We've added some more detail as we've gotten more familiar with the design process and some decisions we've made along the way. But just to kind of highlight some of the key and major milestones uh, for, the, for the timeline. So, that design approval process, so you'll see July 21 through July 22. If you remember, I think tomorrow is our year anniversary of actually the referendum passing. So from last year to this year, all the work that's been done is really around really enhancing that schematic design that was presented to the community at the point of referendum. So there's been a lot of work within the committee, within our design committee meetings within all sorts of subcommittee meetings to make sure that we really enhance that design to meet the educational specifications. So that was kind of that year difference that you see there. And then we move into the bidding and awards to subcontractors. So again, that July timeframe of 2022 to September of 2022. So coming up right on our heels here. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that early enabling phase that you see there, which is involving site traffic and parking work. So we're going to go into that in more detail, but just kind of keep that in the back of your mind for now. Moving right on to phase one. So that's actually construction of the new high school building. And so this is the timeline that everybody really cares about. That's September 2022 to August of 2024. So what we're saying there is that the high school will be built. The new high school building will be completed in August of 2024, which would allow us to move students into the building in that fall time frame. Make sense? All right, and then one of the things we wanted to mention that was in the newsletter is the groundbreaking ceremony. So this is really exciting for us. October timeframe is what we're looking for here. This is really a celebration of all the work that has been done, community support that we received along the way, and all the work to be done moving forward. So really a great event, lots more to do in planning here, but kind of keep that one in the back of your mind too, and you'll hear more about that in uh, newsletters upcoming, as well as we'll certainly get more communications out about that. Phase two is really renovation of that central office or locker room. So a lot of times you'll hear that referred to as the 900 wing. Um, and that's really part of that June 24 to 25, July 25 timeframe. So that's the renovation of central office and the demolition of the current high school building. Now you'll see a note in there, but that does not include the 1928 building in our planning. So one of the things I want to make sure you, everyone here is very clear on, and everybody online is very clear on, is that I will not be talking about anything regarding the 1928 building this evening, so, or any of my, my counterparts here tonight. It is an initiative that's happening within town. It certainly is closely aligned with our project, but it is a separate project altogether with a separate building committee managing the, the work around it. So, Again, I, you know, we certainly are, are very aligned and, and keeping in close contact. We have a liaison from our building committee on the 1928 building committee. So it is certainly something we're communicating and making sure that, that we're staying in touch with each other on, but it's not something that I'm going to address tonight. 
So then moving on to that phase three or site work is January 2025 to June 2025. So when we're talking about a complete project, <coughs> everything is done. The building is complete, the 900 wing or the central office and locker rooms are complete, the site work associated to any, any work that we've done is complete. The end date is that June 2025. Makes sense to everybody? So here's where we're gonna kind of dig in a little bit deeper to some of the things we've talked about or I've mentioned here on um, early enabling phase, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about um, we're also going to get an update um, from CAT on value engineering and the importance of that to a project like this and our project specifically. Uh, we're going to talk about project budget and state reimbursement, which we've got great news about and are happy to share. And then uh, Kathy Greer is going to give us kind of an update and a really good analysis of our interior renderings and what that means to learning overall. Like, you know, it was a great update that I heard the other day from her, and it's, it's really exciting to kind of see all those pieces come together. So one of the things that we want to talk about a little bit more is that early naming phase. So it's going to be, hopefully, you'll be able to see the, the, the schematic up there, which is a little tough. But one of the things we've talked about as a building committee is how best to make sure that the pieces of this project that we can put in place in order to help our overall timeline for completion, as well as how we can really insist assist with the district in helping the transition from uh, school ending into construction. How, how do we make that move as smoothly as possible? And one of the things we talked about is we could really gain some efficiency as well as kind of remove some of the implications of having students on site during pre-construction work. And how can we make that a little bit easier for everybody? So this was a solution that was brought forward to us, which was an early enabling phase, which allows us to do, as you see there, preliminary site work, installing construction fence for safety and security, and construction of a temporary parking lot earlier in the process. So that process, as of right now in our conversations, will begin as of July 11th of 2022. So we're looking at the students having already finished school for the school year, starting this enabling or construction prep so that we are ready and prepared for construction to begin more towards the end of October. But it's really gaining some efficiency of not having the kids in actually in the school and on site as we're doing some of this work, allowing us to really get a good handle on um, traffic patterns and making sure we can do some good communication efforts around that and making sure we really uh, understand and can protect um, our students, making sure it's a safe environment, getting a lot of that work done so that it's all in place by the time they come back to school at the end of August. Does that make sense to everybody? I'm going to point out a couple things. Hopefully you'll be able to see up there on the diagram. But you should see kind of a, a green line in the very top of the picture. Does everybody see it up there? So that green line is really what we're, that's the construction area, the construction fencing that we're talking about that will go in place during this enable, early enabling phase. Some of the, the red and blue lines you'll see are really kind of traffic patterns. And again, the conversations we've been having with the police department and with the district and making sure we do this in a way that's safe and efficient. Um, we all know that parking is already a challenge in that area. So we're doing everything we can to see if we can improve that and make sure that you know, it's, it's as efficient as possible um, throughout construction. And the other piece that I do want to point out is kind of this gray oval in the bottom right hand portion of the, the picture. And that's really the temporary parking lot that I mentioned. So again, if you picture the lot, when you get in our current world, it's where the tennis courts are and kind of that parking lot that's to um, the right of the existing building. If you're, if you're facing forward or coming up Monteith, that's where the, the construction fencing is going to go. And then we want to make sure we supplement parking during the time of construction. So you can see kind of where that temporary parking lot is going to go in relation to the library. So it's really going in that green field at the base of the hill, right by the library, to help with parking. Yes? Can we ask questions? Yeah, uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I think we're small enough here. here so okay, because I do, this is, I'm John LaForest Royce, 51 Tango Road. I do have a couple of questions relative to the early enabling phase. 
Um, specifically, um, does it include the uh, widening or the entrance from uh, Crestwood Drive, which is off of the Highlands? Um, what is the involvement have been with the Highlands uh, neighborhood? And is any of the berm work and the emergency road included in any of that? Um, that was suggested by me probably about a year and a half ago, um, pre-COVID probably. Um, but I, I think it's important that those kind of things be looked at in advance, um, especially with um, uh, parking. One of the things that we are already seeing in the Highlands um, is that there is a need to get with the um, town traffic committee or commissions, as well as the police department. We have a number of folks that are parking on streets in the Highlands currently because they were not able to get a parking pass or whatever in the springtime. No, no problem with that, but I can see that being escalated much more. Um, none of the Highlands has any kind of one side of the road parking, no parking signs for where there's a hill, where there's an intersection. And we have a number of people that live there and currently park in some of those places. And I see that only being escalated. So if there's a way that if these are not included, those other things I mentioned, the berm and the, the emergency access road and riding of Western of Crestwood, um, I think very important about the parking is that that be addressed early on. I mean, maybe even before the school year is over or, or at least educating folks that come September when they're gonna have to use this parking lot, their alternative is now not to use Highwood, Knollwood, and lots of the other side streets that are around there because uh, they will. So, so let's take them a, a, a one at a time here, yeah. and we're all you can. I think you can help us. Rose here from ONG is, and she's kind of our expert on it, our early enabling package. But as far as what's included, um, as far as the the widening or any kind of uh, updates to that the access. Is that part of early enabling? When you say widening, there's a little bit of a driveway there. Yep. Is that the Crestwood? Yes. Right. The only thing we're doing in there is we're putting a gate in this summer. Uh, it's like a vehicle gate. We're going to be replacing the gates that, that's there. And we will be doing all the plantings. The berm went away. It's more of a, just a planting. So they, they decided they wanted to kind of leave the existing growth there. It's actually better. So we're supplementing with a whole bunch of plantings. That's part of this first phase, but physically it won't get done until closer to the fall, because that's when you plant the trees. True, I, I think, yeah. I mean, um, I know that when you come to do construction time, Crestwood is gonna be your entrance for bringing in your equipment, et cetera. No, no. 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 we're never bringing in. You're never bringing in Crestwood? No. Okay. That was on the platter. Just What's students. that? Uh, students from the Highlands. Just walking. Walking, okay. All right, um, and then the other is, is that, you know, we have quite a bit of um, mismatch of the town not being really responsible and cleaning up fences and all those kind of things that are along that area, which is now wooded. And, you know, no one maintains any of that. No one really knows where somebody's property line is, any of that kind of stuff, because there's a mismatch of, of fences. So I think that's, one of the things that really definitely needs to be worked out with the town is making sure that, you know, either if, if you have to cut back any trees or, or if you're planting trees or whatever, you know, that you're doing it on the town property, not on somebody's backyard. Yeah, I'm pretty sure we're leaving. There's an existing fence that's somewhat buried in the woods. Yeah. I believe that's staying. That's not part of our plan. We are just merely supplementing the trees. Okay. That are there now. Yeah. And, and from the, the traffic perspective, I know, um, Scott and his team is working very hard on the best way to communicate out on what the traffic pattern changes are. Um, that's something that's going to be forthcoming, and I'm sure part of that conversation is, you know, how what's what really is the appropriate way that we should be managing parking, and that's not using neighborhood access streets in possible. Yeah, we're beginning that communication actually this week with, with students, uh, grades seven through twelve, seven through eleven, and yeah. um, the twelfth graders as well. But we'll be off somewhere else next year. Uh, so we began that and we have more communication coming. Okay. Uh, we're going to start our parking distribution months earlier than we ever have before to try to, to, try to get all that. From yeah, there. I'm, so, I know the few that are parking in the Highlands right now are probably mid-year students. They might be juniors that got a license. 
now have the ability to drive, but don't have a place to get a parking spot, um, which is understandable. You know, everybody. Everybody's I think it's something we continue to address and, and yeah. evaluate and monitor as we go. I think that's all. Uh, another question relative to that walkway, Crestwood coming in. Uh, will the walkway be along the construction fence, or will be this, or will there be some kind of pathway extended around the other side of the uh, the football field, which would be, make more sense to get them into the current school building? It's going to follow. Yeah, no, I couldn't answer that. It's going to follow the. It's going to follow that planting line. So you have two entrances there. Okay. I can stand on. I'm Nelson Reese. I'll be running the project. <laughs> and actually, my daughter. I live in. Uh, my daughter walks to school from the Highlands. Yeah. Um, so along that green line, uh, both uh, we're going to be paving a path and segregating the students with the construction fence. And they're going to come around the back. They're going to hug the, the football field track area. And then there's going to be a crosswalk on the back end of the school. So they're, they're not going to be near the tennis court area currently. They're going to be moved around towards the back of the pond. But completely segregated yeah. with a construction fence and a paved walkway. Yeah. I mean, I, I think the folks from the lower streets there are, are wood in those. Um, what they'll end up doing is just cutting through the, the town hall to get to, they'll just come through those neighborhoods backyard to come that way and come around the town hall. completely fenced off. So yeah. they're, they're not currently not. <laughs> it's currently not. Um, the other would be is it make, makes sense if there was pathway around the the outside of the, the football field. I mean, even if it was just a, a walkway right around it, because you could bring them where your fence is going to be right now is behind the um, the bleachers for the uh, for the uh, uh, football field. I mean, if you had them coming right along the 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 hit that the hill of the football field, they're coming right into the back of the school into the uh, the current 900 wing. Um, I'm just thinking about where kids are going to make their path, and they're going to make their path there because they're going to be coming from the Highlands areas. You know, other than that, they're not going to go all the way over to the back side of uh, Ledgewood where they would come over the, the, the crest from the soccer field. So, um, you think about where kids are going to go, they're going to go right around the, the construction fence. And to me, they're going to go right behind the uh, the uh, the stands for the for the football field. Right at the top of the baseball field, because that's where your fence is going to be. Oh, we got a few other matters. I know we have a hand on line as well. Um, what, I think that if you guys don't mind, let me just take who's on who's uh, Catherine, hey, um, my concern is how this um, parking area is going to affect the library and library programs and such. I know I've gotten stuck in, in the library parking lot when schools let out and not been able to get out for like half an hour. <laughs> and um, because of the traffic. So I really do worry about how that's going to impact people coming in and out of the library. I also know that the library uses the field sometimes for um, concerts and things. Um, so I don't know if that's going to play into any, any planning, but I thought they would mention it. Thank you. Thanks, Catherine. Yeah, we're going to, we can talk a little bit more about um, some of the planning around that. 
Um, I don't know, Scott, if you want to give at least where we kind of are on planning around that the temporary parking lot and traffic patterns. Sure, I can speak to the traffic patterns. Maybe Chad can speak more on the library programming side. So, um, yeah, there's a few times a day that aren't great to be to be around 10 Monteith Drive. Uh, one is, you know, in the early morning hours, and the second is around 223. So uh, I think we'll still expect escalated traffic patterns during that time. We've been partnering closely with the Farmington Police Department. We also have a security and monitoring team um, up at the high school. Uh, the high school staff monitor the high school property we're not allowed to direct traffic on town roads but working closely with our police department here we expect that we'll have at minimum two officers um where you see the red line uh off monteith drive taking a left uh into the you know traversing through the library lot into the temporary lot and then taking the right back out onto monteith uh, we've been told that we expect an officer there, both at arrival times and dismissal times, to help with the traffic flow. Um, and then we'll have an additional officer working the working the traffic light uh, during those times. So the police department has said they expect us to have at least two officers daily helping with the traffic there on Monteith. So we're hoping that will help alleviate some of it, although it will be heavier during the times of arrival and dismissal. Uh, and then I'll hand it over to Kat maybe for the for the library program inside. Absolutely. Um, we are working on coordinating meetings with library staff to make sure that we can make accommodations and do whatever we can because we are all sharing that burden us in town hall and library and also Staples House. Um, I have had conversations with community and recreational services who are in Staples House and who have the summer concert series every Thursday. Um, I believe they are able to get in a few of the concerts before the construction begins. And then they have made accommodations to have the concerts at the same location on that municipal campus site, but in a different area. Um, so we are trying to work as best as we can with all of the um, inhabitants of the municipal campus so that we can do the best we can to, to get through this together. Yeah, um, Matt, I'm going to report me, but thanks for the presentation. Thanks for taking the Q&A. So just for this early enabling, and just in general, I'm just curious how much we're spending on these one-time sort of temporary costs and making sure we're doing everything we can to limit those. I'm sure we are. Just one for this slide is the temporary parking lot, right? Like, what, what does temporary mean? Is it asphalt? Is it gravel? Is it grass? How does it look like when it insults and how does it look like when it goes away? Oh, yeah, again, we just try to, I know, you know, building a parking lot is probably not inexpensive. So are we, are we limiting the you know, amount of cost we're, we're putting into that? Well, we're we're just, on, just on scope overall yes. of what's included. It's going to be a paved parking lot, so it will look like a paved parking lot. However, the construction of it is not high quality in that it's meant to crumble in two years. So we're doing a thinner base. It's a very thin uh, asphalt on top. So we're building it as cost effective as we can, but it will look like a regular parking lot. It will have lights. When the construction is done, it will then be removed and it will be completely restored and will be restored. But we're constructing it as cost effective as we can, knowing that it's only going to be there for two years. And just because I'm curious, so why does it need to be paid versus the grass, right? Like, I don't know if it's crazy, but it's got a and things like that. Right. It's just I think this is the way it's kind of more of a challenge. Yeah. Yeah. Safety, it's, it's public works and plowing and safety and striping. So you get 135, but if you don't have a paved area with markings, then you only get 110 cars. Right. Maybe someone's parked in the way, maybe someone's parked in the driving way. Unfortunately, it's, it's temporary, but it's still there for two solid years with two full time with kids walking through it. And, you know, we did what we could to limit the access through, you know, traversing up the sledding hill for safety reasons to keep them on, uh, you know, paved paths. So we did everything we could to remove the texture cost. Um, but this, between the town requirements for public works and the things on the safety side, um, this is basically the minimum we did. Yeah, uh, just two questions. First one, what is the plan for the track team view of that? So, shot put this is Jeff. Um, I guess, two second question. What are you going to do over the next two years? And then, 
maybe voice that was not yet. But I guess if you pull up your parking class, you can have a lot of fresh. What are you doing the next two years? For the two years. Yeah. So so we haven't finalized there's a few different athletics impacts, not only shot put javelin. Well shot put is actually in the green fence there. Javelin is on the base of, of the FL where you're talking about, Mr. Kelly. Um, so what I expect is we'll most likely be moving those to the upper fields. We're gonna to have to do some other shuffling around with athletics. Tennis is impacted, baseball is impacted. So we have some other impacts with our athletics program, but we've noted those and discussed those. We're gonna lose all of our field events. We're gonna to have to move those. Likely we're thinking to the upper field, all three to the upper field um, that we'll have a piece of those. And my second question is, and I know this is your bailiwick, but the latest 1928 committee that's underway, is planning to keep a significant portion of the existing in the old high school in addition to the 1928, you know, side built. Uh, so, as example, the two gyms and all that goes with that behind the 1928 bill. So, if they should do that, uh, this would eliminate the planned relocation of the baseball field to that portion of the ground where the baseball field was going to go to on your plan. So I know these are two different committees colliding, but I'm thinking about the baseball kids now. And uh, should this second committee be successful, and the farm can were always successful, the question is then where the, where's the baseball field go? So the, the quick answer is we don't have an answer for that because the committee, the 1928 committee, has just started to meet. Yeah. And yes, they're looking at all those options. I will add that the baseball field is still an alternate right now, which we'll get into a little bit more because of obviously a lot of the issues with the environment uh, fiscally and inflation and all that stuff. Um, we've had to go through a series. So that baseball field is, is in question at this point, regardless of what the 1928 bill does. Okay. So, and my issue is with you folks, not good work you've done, but you know, if we're going to uh, basically look at doubling the Town Hall facilities up on Montpeach Drive. You know, for cost and crunch reasons, we've already taken out a girls' softball field, right? Uh, and now we're talking about taking out a baseball field. But I just want to make sure we're, we're all on the right uh, priorities here when we get done spending all this money. And again, I know every committee is just optimizing to their specific um, mission, but, uh, you know, to the average citizen, I'd like to see it all make sense five years from now as opposed to yeah. the, the um i mean there are separate committees i will say that there is some overlap in the sense that uh, uh we have a representative on our building committee that is part of the 1928 committee right. so that if there is something glaring uh that needs to be addressed it'll come up sooner than later and obviously with the overlap from the council standpoint um, we're aware, especially with myself being on the council, and then looking at uh, Chris Fagan being both part of it. And I've been on the high school committee for long enough. I don't even know how long anymore. <laughs> uh, that we we are going to be getting updates every two weeks or every month as we meet um, to make sure. So there is some communication between the two communities, just to make sure we're not doubling efforts or missing something. Yeah, I'm foreseeing a uh, baseball field at that might be enough to get you to move to another state. <laughs> Go ahead. I, you know, I think to that point, you know, this, there's a lot of coordination. There's a lot of things we're talking about today that, you know, that, you know, we are still, remember, in design. Um, at this point, we're still, uh, we've made a lot of great decisions and are moving forward together, but there's a lot of dependencies um, in the work that we're doing, uh, with other things that are happening in town. Um, you know, our goal, and I will reiterate it, you'll hear it again probably multiple times tonight, is obviously our goal from the building perspective is to, um, you know, maintain educational programming whenever we can. That is the top priority. So as you hear us have all these conversations, please know, and I think you sh the community does know that, that how important that is to us um, as, as a committee and, and really our, it shapes all our conversation and focus. So. You know, again, it, it's not easy. 
this is a big project. There's a lot of pieces and parts and timing and, and coordination um, and dependencies, but you know, we're going to try to keep bringing these forward to you. We appreciate the comments um, and the thinking around it because I think it's, it just shows how engaged the community is and wanting to make sure this is, this is successful for the town of Farmington overall and with all these projects. So you know, you'll hear a little bit more about this, but as we learn more, as we make decisions, you know, we're, we're doing those at, at building committees every at building committee meetings every two weeks, but we'll try to do these more often too to give people an opportunity to ask questions and really kind of dig a little deeper on some of the work we're doing. Online. All right. Great conversation. A lot, a lot going on there. There we go. So I'm going to turn this over to Kat now that we've kind of done a high level overview. And she can kind of do some of the DE and uh, budget information. Hi, everyone. So throughout each phase of the building project, and now we've gone through schematic design, enhanced schematic design, design development, and we are now finishing up construction documents. The professional partnership team conducts cost estimates based on current market conditions. If the construction estimates come in over budget, which they have, the building committee completes value engineering, or VE, to bring the cost back to the original budget. Now, please note that value engineering is a standard practice in building projects, both large and small. So this is nothing new or specific to our building projects. The process involves a professional partnership team meeting with the design working group to identify line items in the project that can one, be removed from the scope of the project, or two, include them as add alternates in the event that bidding prices are favorable and items can be added back into the project. We have identified a number of alternates that we would like to prioritize and add back into the project if bidding is favorable. When approving VE items, and Meg just alluded to this, our main priority is not to impact educational programming. The building committee reviews the VE list created and then approves them at the building committee meetings. Our last round of VE was approved, and this is after the design development phase, on May 11th, and the updated cost estimate for construction costs was $361,000 below the original budget. So this is just a snapshot of our budget after design development. And again, these estimates are based on current market conditions, but we won't be locked into pricing until bids are received at the end of the summer. So just a quick, quick rundown. Um, Architectural and design, engineering design fees total 5.6 million, professional fees 2.9 million, construction costs 115.6 million, FF and E and technology 5.1 million, owner contingency 6.3 million for a grand total of 135.5 million, which is on target for our authorization that was just about a year ago today at 135.6 million. There has been an update on the next line for great, uh, state reimbursement. I'm sure you have heard that we have, thanks to our legislative delegation, an increased rate to 30% for both parts of the project. We had varying reimbursement rates for the high school project and the 900 wing, but now it is 30% for all of it. This is an increase of 14.4 million in funding that we did not anticipate for a total of $40.6 million in reimbursement from the state of Connecticut. This means that the net town share has moved from 109.3 million, like we thought it would be before referendum, to 94.9 million. So that's a great savings to the taxpayers of Farmington. Do we have any questions about these? <laughs> well, I'm just, just right. Just for the record, yes. just a question I heard. So, just why couldn't the town take that 14 million dollars and increase the budget to help pay for inflation and not have to cut back on square footage or not lose a softball field or not lose a baseball field and keep those in there and use that 14 million. Right. Again, just curious, like the, the mechanics of that. Because we are bound to that $135.6 million that was passed at referendum. And that's what our budget is built on. 
So even though we are making these value engineering decisions, we're still at that $135.6 million total. So that 30% reduces the net town share, but unfortunately it does not account for those escalations uh, you know, that, we're, that we're seeing. In order for us to spend one additional penny, we would have to go back for a referendum in, to get it approved. So we are bound to that number. That we're, we're, we can only spend 135, whatever. Correct. Okay. Correct. Yes. So my question is a little bit of a corollary to that. Maybe it's the same answer. Uh, but we have ARPA funds today to the tune of about 7.5 million that come from the feds. So not part of the whole um, state algorithm. You know, here's what you can spend, here's what we'll, you know, rebating all that stuff, right? So this is the money that comes from forever. Um, could we use those funds either to lower the amount of debt we have to carry on this project uh, and or maybe again, cover that softball field, baseball field, um, you know, keep the best group on the building we can, whatever it is that we're kind of struggling with now. And the only reason I say that is, you know, 5% overage, which isn't a lot in today's inflation environment for construction, uh, after about 140 million is seven million dollars. So you know we've kind of I think pared down you know a couple of three million here. I don't know if all that works out right over the next two years. We haven't even broke the ground yet. Now I'd love to be wrong on that. Um, but again with the ARPA funds, can we treat those differently than sort of all the state and kind of in-house money that we have to uh, manage based on where we're going. So the yeah. ARPA yeah, no, it makes sense. Just so the ARPA funds have strings attached that don't allow you to pay down debt uh, or reduce budgets, etc. That's the money came over. It was a lot more stringent. The rules have been somewhat relaxed because a lot of towns like Farmington were sitting on the money. Right. Yes, it could be used to do a a baseball field afterwards. Right. Because it could be used to any capital project. Um, there is a, a committee uh, just looking at ARPA funds. They have some recommendations, at least recommending the types of projects we shouldn't be doing, but no formal recommendations have happened. Some of the discussion has been along those lines. If, you know, depending on what happens with the 1928 committee, what gets removed from things that could be done as a capital project are all open, but nothing's been discussed in, in detail or voted on in this one. So the short answer is no on the debt. Yes, we could do auxiliary projects. Legally, I don't know if we can attach it to the high school. I think it would have to be done as a standalone project. That I would leave the, the smarter people in the room to, to answer that part. But that one would be kind of a wiggle room kind of thing where you'd have to set it up. Mm -hmm. I don't know exactly how that would work. And, and just one thing to note about the overall budget is because we're going out again at each phase of the project, we are getting those current market conditions. Um, for example, for escalation before referendum, we started, and correct me if I'm wrong, at around 4%. And now we're up to 8% because of what's going on in, in, the, in the environment. So we are trying to account for all of these things so that when we do go to bid, hopefully we're on or below. That's our goal. Um, by getting the most up-to-date numbers that we possibly can. We are getting another update. Uh, we just finished construction documents, so we are doing this whole VE. Hopefully we don't have to do a lot and we're, we're right on there, but uh, we are getting an updated cost estimate in the next probably month or so. Uh, John, again, this is actually for, uh, for uh, John, for, for going back to the council. I think it'd be important that the council give some kind of communication up to the town, what the impact is of that increased um, uh, reimbursement for the school, because a lot of people's minds are gonna go directly to, does that mean I'm gonna have to pay less tax, okay? And, and really, it may or may not be at the point when this is finished, because we don't know what the costs are gonna be. You're not gonna get your reimbursement until your project is complete, all of it, those kind of things. But a lot of folks, all they've read in the paper and all they can read in here is that there's been you know, an extra $14 million. And their immediate mind is, well, 
that should be coming back to us and it should be lowering our, our tax rate that we already voted that we're going to be spending it. So I think that's an important thing for the town council to communicate on behalf of this building. I, I agree with you. It, it is a, a difficult thing to talk about because it's confusing. Yeah. But yes, it's exactly right. That 14 million is less money the town has to budget for long term yeah. in, in future bonding. I will add to that that the council decided to bond double uh, it, this spring. So instead of bonding 20 million this year, we actually bonded 40. And the way it worked out, we got a, a, a slam dunk interest rate. Mm -hmm. So it's not just the 14 million, we're also going to save on the long term. Yeah. But you're, you're absolutely right. Something simple and easy to follow would be a, a good idea to communicate out. And, and like Johnny was just talking about with that, that bonding. Uh, when we were showing that financial forecast before referendum, we said that we're always trying to look for ways to help mitigate that tax impact. And that's, that's one of the ways we did that, because we knew the feds were going to raise the interest rate multiple times this year. And we tried to capitalize on that by locking in at a lower interest rate and bonding more. So I think that'll help in the out years um, where we're not having to pay as much interest throughout the course of the project. I mean, I know you guys are the, the experts as far as the building and the value added and those kind of things, but I think it's the council's responsibility to communicate that to the town versus looking to you guys to say, you know, what is my savings? Because you're just trying to deal with the cost and right. bidding and all that kind of stuff. It really should be back to council. And, it, and, I, and I think there's still a lot of unknowns until right. we have those bids on bid deck to yep. see where we are. Yep. Matt, did you have a yeah, question? There's two more quick sort of value engineering. So I assume that if the committee is going through and once the real prices are coming in, you have to sort of reduce certain aspects of the project. Is there any sort of document for the town to show, here's where we voted on this project in June 2021, and here's what we were expecting, and here's where we are today based on all of these circumstances that have happened in terms of pricing or the gym was going to be this size, and now the gym is this size, or the weight room is this size, I think it gives a feel for people like here's what's actually going on once the sort of real world bidding is happening. Yeah, absolutely. And we had the same feeling. Um, so at our last meeting, we actually had a list compiled of every action we've taken for VE items. And that is everything we even looked at and said, absolutely not, we're not doing that. Because it's our professional partnership job, our professional partner's job to come to us and say, here's everything we could do to reduce the cost of this project. And some of them might impact programming. So we said, absolutely not. So you can see each step of the way through each design development phase, what we've accepted or rejected. Um, that is in the minutes, but I will make sure it's more prominent on our website. Is that any major? Uh, I, mean, I mean, I just heard the town, like, no, is that is it minor stuff or no one, the lay person would know? I think, I think some of them are more minor. Things like finishes or you know stuff like that. Piping we're using. Yeah, you know, this, I think the type of roof we're using. We didn't look equivalent, but less classroom. So. No, no, and again, because that would impact programming. I think the biggest one, and Johnny had mentioned it, the is ball. the baseball field, and, and we did have that as an alternate, so that if bidding's favorable, we can look at that again. So the list that we compiled of things we accepted to reduce, things we rejected, and things that we said we're not ready to cut this. But we're, we're ready to put it here, prioritize it, and then if we do have the chance, we'll go back and add it back in. And on that alternate list, you will see, I believe there's eight items on it right now. Those are not in priority order. The building committee will then need to take a look at it and say, this is number one we want to put back into the project, and then, and, and then you know, go down the list accordingly. I, I might have one of the things that's in the BE, the, the lowest hanging fruit wasn't even cutting things out of scope, it was substitute. Right. This for that. This for that. Like you still have a you know a different brick versus the brick that was that was spec. We save money, so it's not a it's not a loss of something. It's just a substitution of of, of one product versus another. Exactly. Is there any value engineering tied to that aspect of nineteen twenty eight? Tied to not the town has made a decision on nineteen twenty eight or the existing building. Is there any value engineering tied to that decision not being made? I mean, let's say, for example, that decision was made tomorrow. Would we be able to do better value engineering for this project? There, there's an alternate. So, for example, the demolition of the entire 
current facility is included in our base bid. But we do have an alternate that says, okay, if the gym stay or a little bit more than the 1928 building stays, what's the cost? And we want to ask this up front so we get the best, we hope to get the best pricing. <laughs> um, what's the cost to not demo this? And that would be a credit back to the building committee. So although there are some unknowns, we're trying to be as flexible as possible and try to be as smart as possible so that if there are returns to the building committee, we can maximize those. And the time frame that was set in place for the 1928 building is supposed to have those answers so that we can still facilitate our end on any savings or or questions that are left, you know, answered basically. So we, we will react on that. Can I just point yeah. clarification that the ninth the demolition of the ninth point itself is not, is not yes, thank that. you for clarifying that. So I guess my question is because we haven't made a decision on that that section of the building for the other years, whatever other years, there's something going on with, is there something going on with the value engineering where because the town has made a decision, if the town said, listen, the old the existing building is no longer going to exist. How much better value engineering would this project would you be able to do with this project? Or how much how much is it costing the town? Because again, we haven't made a decision yet. Well, like Mark just said, the 1928 is not included. There are no dollars associated with the standalone 1928 building. We actually took those out before referendum. So, so if the 28 so stays, it does not impact yeah. the building. So the 135 budget. million. Does not include does not anything. include any of the existing building. It includes the existing facility demolition, except for the 1928 building itself. And the renovation. There's there's an area that's staying. The oh, and the 900. Yes, yeah, right. that's not being demolished. It is, and, and this is where it's they're very separate, confusing. but they're intertwined. Correct. It, it's very confusing, and it's it's one of those things that almost uh, charts that need to be drawn. But there's just so many question marks that I think would be more confusing than anything. But at the end of the day, the 1928 building will have its own referendum, regardless of what they vote on. Because they'll vote to tear it down, they're going to need money for that. Right. They'll vote to leave it as is, they're going to need money to patch the back of the building. Or they'll vote to keep the whole thing. And we will then only then see some savings on our side because we're not demolishing the gyms and the auditorium area. But it's not a big number. It's you know a few hundred thousand or something like that. It's nothing crazy, but it would allow us a little extra money to maybe put in little things that we thought that we could we really needed or prioritize. But it is completely separate, but there won't be a ton of impact on our side. Any other questions? Okay, I'm going to pass it over to Kathy Greeter to go over interior renderings. Good evening, um, and it's really wonderful to be here and to be sharing some of the renderings, the interior renderings of the building. Uh, first and foremost, as superintendent and behalf, on behalf of the Board of Education, I just want to thank the residents of Farmington for their support of the new FHS facility. This is really an asset uh, to our community and will serve generations of students. And uh, we're really excited about a very flexible uh, school facility that will accommodate changes and educational trends over time. And so I hope that you see some examples of that as I go through the interior renderings. Uh, Farmington's uh, vision of the global citizen is really central to how we develop curriculum, programming, how we deliver uh, that curriculum, and now it really has been central to the design of the new high school. So our students, I think it's important to talk about how our students learn today because it has changed. Um, our students are engaged in much more active learning uh, that is collaborative and self-directed. Um, and our new high school is being designed for that type of learning. So some examples, our students uh, work on projects where they're expected to apply knowledge to very complex problems. And so this looks like, it, what it looks like in classrooms is small group uh, work, circle of debates, demonstrations, partner work, and independent work. And this changes day to day, period by period. Um, and so we really do need flexible space throughout the new high school design. 
So our students are much more involved today than ever before in hands-on making and doing, uh, creating and producing. Uh, very, very active learning, not passive, and doing the real work of scientists, musicians, artists, engineers, builders, and designers. So this state-of-the-art uh, building will create learning spaces that really accommodate uh, students being very active within their classrooms, but also outside in the hallways, we have a very large main street in this building, and within that space, there are spaces for students to work together. Um, that is something that you would see in the current high school, but in very narrow hallways, and it makes it very difficult to have a very large hallway. We're gonna have a lot of space for that type of learning. We also will have new spaces that we have never had before, like a black box theater, maker space, um, and robotics. Uh, we hope to also expand biomedical programming in our high school. We are a hub here in Farmington because of Jackson Lab and the Yukon Medical Center, and that's something our students are very interested in. Um, so our students really learn best when there's this combination of independent and interdependent time for thinking, writing, reflection, reading, and research. So as I go through the renderings, I hope you see evidence of that. And um, we really want our students to be prepared for the future and become global citizens who are thinkers, collaborators, contributors, empowered learners, and real, really self-aware individuals. So on this slide, you're going, you see a diagram on the left, which is the first floor um, of the new high school. And you will see access to the school, which is at the front of the building or the right side of the diagram of this left hand uh, diagram. There's a large hallway or a main street that welcomes all students and provides access to all parts of the building, a very different design than we currently have. Um, and at the bottom of the left-hand side uh, diagram is the after hours access, which is at the bottom of that diagram. And this is really for community access. And it's very close to the gymnasiums and the auditorium and the black, black box theater. And then you see on the right-hand side are the, is the upper floor. So the entrance of the building, as students walk in, will look like this. Uh, it is important to know that the finishing and the, the finishings and the color scheme within these photos are subject to change. We're still working on that. There's a large open hallway space that will allow, allow for large groups of students to enter without feeling crowded immediately as they enter that building. Again, a very different feel. Uh, and our students are currently experiencing. So I want you to really notice how the hallway is used as a flexible learning space uh, with flexible furniture that can be moved and changed depending on what the activity might be there. Um, students, again, will have a lot of self-direction within this building. So they can choose to, uh, instead of being in the cafeteria, come to this space and huddle up and work on a project. Um, and it really is very much like the world of work and what students will experience in college. So we're really excited uh, that our community, our students will enter this high school. And this is just a really inspiring rendering of that entryway. The next uh, picture that I'm showing to you is a hallway amphitheater within uh, the first floor. And so notice that this is an informal space that can be utilized for a variety of events and learning experiences, presentations, having outside experts come in and have showcases, study groups, community events, demonstrations of learning. And if you have a high school student, you know about our Aspire and Capstone project. Um, that is a mastery-based project at the end, usually at the end of a high school student's career. It's a, it's a um, mandate for a graduation requirement. And students, this will be a space that potentially some of those um, projects could be displayed or presented to others. Uh, teachers can bring students out to this space as an alternate uh, to the classroom learning environment. This is an opposite view looking down the hallway behind the amphitheater main street hallway space. And you can see there's a great deal of light and an open field. Uh, no longer do you see narrow hallways. Instead, it's really inspiring space for our students that will include displays of work products on the walls. That's a real priority and the type of learning that students engage in, that they can display their work 
and they could um, have opportunities to critique one another's work. So whether it's in classrooms or outside in the hallway or our cafeteria, you're going to see a lot of display areas so that we can really feature to our, both within our own school community, but also the larger community, um, those projects. Uh, this is a view of the cafeteria, which is between the gymnasiums and the auditorium. Uh, there are, again, display cases to showcase learning projects, as well as collaborative space, independent space, and flexibility, and how we utilize this area of the high school, both during the school day and after school, when we are hosting athletic events, as well as music and theater productions. This will be really exciting, both for our students, but also for our entire community. Uh, right now, our auditorium is not really utilized a lot by the community, and I think we'll have many, many more requests to utilize the Black Black Theater and our auditorium. And um, so this building really is exciting, not only for our students, but for the whole community. Uh, this is a rendering of the FHS gymnasium, one of them, we have two, uh, just like our current building, there are two gymnasiums to accommodate for during the day and after school athletic, physical education and health and wellness programming. Uh, you can see our new River Hawks uh, mascot logo is there and this looks more like a gymnasium at a university level. And this space allows us to now host statewide championships. So we're really excited about that and having that opportunity to do that at home within our own school instead of going to other schools to do that. Um, and here's an example of an art space. Uh, students will really be inspired by the beautiful view of the Farmington landscape outside. And you see some really creative ways of, um, you know, looking at the ceiling work and things like that. So again, we want to create a building that is a really inspiring our students to be creative, curious learners. Uh, we also feel that, and we know from research, that um, the environment that students are in is important for their social, emotional well-being. That is a real priority now as we are coming out of the pandemic. And um, we, we know that students, when it comes to learning, there is an emotional base to learning. So we want students to come in and be uh, happy and inspired. And you know, the, the light and the openness of this building, I think will really benefit our students uh, in new ways. So here is um, an example of an orchestra classroom that is fully accept accessible. Right now we have tiers and it is not fully accessible. And it has uh, you know, state-of-the-art acoustic treatment. So this will be a welcoming space for all learners. Uh, the next two slides uh, feature uh, a new program space, which is the Black Box Theater for drama lectures and exhibitions of learning. It's a very flexible space. Things, you know, the seating can be moved. And so we can use this both during the day for academic programming, but also have events at night here that will um, benefit our students as well as the entire community. Uh, the shades are movable. And so it will reveal, reveal light and bringing really the outside into the Black Box Theater. The next two slides show our new auditorium, which is fully accessible with state-of-the-art acoustics. Uh, here's a, di a different view on the next slide. So you're really looking down onto the stage. And again, this is another community space that can be used after hours, but we really look forward to showcasing learning and performances within this space. And that will be across subject areas. We have a, an exciting music program here in Farmington, and I know that, that this space is something that uh, students look forward to because right now the acoustics in our current space is not conducive to performances, and this will be. Um, so that is an overview of the interior renderings. I know when I first viewed this, I was so excited. I know that um, Dr. Hurwitz just reviewed some of this with students. So, you know, we, I, there's an excitement at FHS and IAR because the students coming up are also really, um, you know, they can't wait for the new building to open. So um, I will end there and we'll just open it up to any other questions. <coughs>
Yes. Uh, thank you, uh, Superintendent Greer. And really thanks to the committee and, and the concept. This is really great and helpful. Can you dive in quick on the special education space and how that compares to today's current building space? Yeah, so we're very proud of our special education programming. We have many more programs here in Farmington than most districts. Um, we do try to prioritize um, having our students engage in learning within our buildings so they can fully access all the programming that we have. So we built several specialized programs and um, our educational specifications are specific to the programs that we have. So we're going to have now even better space for those programs that really reflect what's needed. And again, that is flexible space. So as programming changes and adjusts over time, we're going to have the space to do that. Um, I think when you think about this building um, and you look at the classrooms, because the classrooms are so flexible, we can easily move programs around as well. But um, this, this uh, nothing has changed, nothing's been reduced as far as special education programming. And I, I will just reiterate what Kath said. We, I really am very um, appreciative of the high school building committee because they have prioritized not affecting programs. This is a building that will be here for decades and again, educate generations of students. We wanna make sure that the building is large enough and is able to really quickly adapt to changes in enrollment, changes in uh, programming that we will have for the future. You, you talked about my last question, and that's it for me, but so enrollment projections, right? Like we have to make projections for this building for the next 50 years. Has any of that changed in the past year? And obviously we're fortunate to live in a popular town and you know, developers are entering our town with new apartments and and new housing developments that potentially will come in. How, how do we think about that? And that sort of news that kind of happens over the months and years of this project. So that is something that we monitor. Uh, we have an annual report that gets updated to look at the enrollment trends. We have never seen, although other communities have, a decrease in enrollment. I know over the last decade, there were many articles saying that school-age student population is changing that, that, and, and really, uh, being reduced in Connecticut, and districts did experience that, but Farmington never did. We've had very steady enrollment. Um, I think the pandemic is something that we're all going to have to really look at enrollment and the trends that we see. Uh, we've seen uh, many more families moving recently because I think the housing market here in Farmington has, we've just moved a lot more homes uh, than we typically do. So we are watching that. We have an uh, elementary enrollment uh, group that's looking at elementary enrollment, but those elementary numbers move up to the high school. So I think as we continue to deal with the impact of the pandemic, we're going to watch that closely and we will be updating those numbers every year um, so that we're prepared. But again, this is a building that is very flexible and we haven't reduced the classroom size. Uh, we would have to, just like we do with our elementary schools, if, if we had huge enrollment fluctuations, we would just use space differently. And I think this is a building that accommodates for that, but, it, but we do have to continue to monitor that. We did hear from Guilford after they built their new building, they did see an increase in high school enrollment because it's exciting to have a new building in town. So again, I think the enrollment projections are what they are. The square footage is based on the enrollment projections we had at the time. Um, I believe it's uh, 1404 at the highest point in the next 10 years. Um, so that's what the educational specifications and the square footage are based on. And you know we'll continue to monitor that in the future. Thank you. I would just kind of just add that there are space standards that the state requires. So based on your enrollment projections for that eight year period of time, your space standards are limited to the size based on your budget. So the school won't allow you the state form that will allow you to fill the school is going to be wide, but will only reimburse you for up to what those enrollment values in that. So it's really hard to make sure that kind of the, the 
in most of the three years. With Kathy, like, there are a lot of other camps that can work with it to see the opposite. So it's exciting to see. Yeah, that. it's a good thing to have. Yeah, we want to do that. Thank you. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, so that's one of the question here. We're, we're going to take this one, but we do recommend for those of, uh, of, of the community that are joining us, if you just kind of raise your hand and um, provide a comment, it's a little easier than uh, monitoring chat and QA for us. I'm so welcome. Meg, do you want to read it? So, yep. So, um, I understand this presentation addressed the interior of the building, but I am wondering if there will be a solar component for providing some or all of the energy needs of the building. Um, so, this is, I, I know, Danny, you, you've answered some questions on this too. This was something that we uh, did evaluate very early on in the project, actually, pre referendum. Uh, if you had joined us in any of our, our previous conversations, we did a full evaluation of um, solar, um, all sorts of alternate energy options, um, and did full kind of costing analysis on that as far as kind of um, the return of investment back to us based on those. Um, uh, options and we uh, did do some evaluation with town council uh, balanced that against uh, our net useful cost range. If you remember, we had a range of costs that we needed to sit within, um, and it was decided at the point we bought this project to referendum that those components would not be part of our scope of work. That being said, um, it is my understanding that we are doing some work as far as being able to possibly add some of that later on. Um, to the building. So we are not uh, preventing us from possibly um, introducing some of these advantages in the future, but it is not part of our scope of work for this project and will not be delivered as part of that 2024 implementation. Did I get that right across our professional partners? You did, right? So I'm going to add five on that. My name is Mark from the Construction Solutions Group, where we all know that. Mentioned that earlier when I answered the question. So um, there, the, the design does include the structural steel and support capabilities to handle any photovoltaic delivery solution. So we want to make sure that anything we 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 didn't have to go back to the structure of the building or uh, anyway. So the idea would be uh, you know maybe that's a capital project down the road that the town might consider as well as using the ability to convert. Uh, some of the discussion along the way was, you know, the building codes have come a long way in the last 10 or 12 years. We've had many reiterations and the energy has been the focus um, for a lot of it. Um, and so just building the code, I think, puts some elite silver um, from the, uh, you know, from that commercial standpoint. So we're an extremely energy efficient building already. So that's what played into the cost benefit and the payback periods that was considered at the time. Uh, that we were looking at the overall project. And if we can add to we've got our first meeting today, high performance um, review. We've got uh, a, a team of uh, professionals from our uh, commissioning agent to our uh, co owner, who's our HTC uh, uh, mechanical, electrical, plumbing uh, engineers. They're, they're on that uh, team, the architects, the folks from ONG, our folks from um, uh, from our uh, member source all, are all part of that uh, team and we've got a goal uh, to uh, I think to be uh, right now we're, we're tracking at about 19% better than uh, the building standards are, are requiring us to be so we've got a goal to even improve that further but there are energy credits that will be getting back through this process but we've got to hit a certain uh, goal in order to make that happen so we went through a very lengthy list of energy efficiency items that our mechanical units are meeting. There's also air quality units that uh, all those kinds of things that we have to take into consideration, not just energy savings, but um, but uh, green uh, green building as well. Thank you. 
we're going to still keep it open here for questions and answers. I'm just going to kind of move on to the next slide just because there's some information here. Um, I'm not, my point here isn't to cut off any additional discussion, but just want to make sure um, that people have an understanding of kind of upcoming build community meeting dates. This is also included in the newsletter that was sent out, but gives you a good indication that five o'clock time frame also via Zoom. Um, you do also have the availability to watch us uh, after the fact um, on Facebook. If you want to actually view the meetings, um, we have the website as a source of information. There is a contact form on our website that we encourage the entire community to use as far as answering questions. If for some reason something strikes you when you walk out of the, the meeting tonight, based on what we presented, please by all means um, go and use that contact form to come to you know kind of ask questions or get clarification on anything. We're more than happy to do that. Um, and then um, one of the things that I mentioned that maybe also is a resource that, that a little drier, but a really good source of information is our meeting minutes. I know it's not the most exciting reading, and I, I clearly understand that, but it really is an excellent source of not only the comments that are made in the meeting, but also a lot of supporting documentation. But sometimes it's hard to put some pieces together when you're kind of maybe listening in on a meeting. So, I just want to remind people that that exists as well. They can go out and actually take a look at our meeting minutes and, and supporting and, and supplemental documentation. And um, sign up for the chair report. <laughs> oh, and the chair report, of yeah. course. I don't even know why I, I wouldn't even think of that. So <laughs> the, chair, <laughs> the chair report is sent out immediately after each. Um, Devin it does a possible job. Um, it's kind of a quick three to four bullets of main um, decision points that happened in the meeting. Um, and, uh, you know, just another good just way to keep. Um, connected to the project and, and some of the progress and decisions we're making. So um, keep note of these uh, building committee meetings. Um, you can also see that on our website. We have a calendar as well there, so you can actually view. And I believe we're still doing a link out on the calendar uh, dates as well for these meetings. So easy way to get to Zoom links. So you're not kind of digging through things as we all are today in emails. By all means, go right to those dates on the calendar you can actually access. Um, right there to, to uh, join us virtually as well. And then obviously um, the website, our, our Facebook page, Twitter and Instagram, so we try to do our best. We will not inundate these things at any time with you know daily posts or information, but as things are critical, we certainly try to post those out there um, and get information out there. But also don't want to, um, I just want to make sure people understand how valuable the website is, is as well. We're trying our very hardest to keep critical information on that landing page. So the first thing you see is timeline, newsletter, link, things that are very, very timely. Um, and we're going to maintain that moving forward. But there's a lot of information as well within the website too for, for access and just additional details. So just want to make sure that everybody kind of remembers those resources as we leave this meeting. But also, want to just kind of one last opportunity for questions or anything else. Another one. I'm talking. I wasn't. <laughs> I oh. Thank you, Catherine. I have one. Um, I had one of the things I had asked was, had you guys gone back to any of the uh, local uh, um, neighborhood communities like you did before? Um, especially the Highlands. Um, and I think it's important that that group understand your July 11th date before they start making lots of phone calls of racket and things coming up and, and filling up your mailbox. I think that you, it would behoove you guys to put out something, even if you just put some kind of blast, either they have a, their own page or whatever, but, but really look into that, especially for the, those neighbors that surround the high school. I got a better idea. Go on vacation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, we appreciate that feedback, and it's something. Yeah. Thanks. Um, I, I definitely on our radar to make sure that we're engaging and keeping them up to date, as well as um, I don't know if you remember when we were actually doing some of the communications pre-referendum and and oh, well, actually more post-referendum, and talking about how when we, construction actually starts, we'll have liaisons in place that would be specific and, and contact information for neighbors and things like that. So it's, and, and additional communications and meetings. And so we're, we're we know how important that group is um, to just keep them informed. Yeah. Um, so it's definitely on our radar to try yeah, to get out before. I mean, there's a lot of, the reason I came tonight was because very, very um, cryptic on what was included in the enabling, early yes. enabling. Yes. Um, I think you, you could have done a lot more 
information in here on yep. what that included um because that's that was my reason for coming tonight was just from my own neighborhood to say you know what is that going to include sure did you get the sure. information you were i got it all i'm just expecting that i'm going to hear from town council on taxes <laughs> and, and somebody's going to be working with public works and, and traffic commission yeah and, and, and that balance is always hard course. for us to strike yeah. how much do we include and how we but so we appreciate that feedback and i think we can help kind of focus that communication as you mentioned to people yeah. that and direct impacts yeah you know versus kind of a broad yep yeah, traffic habits are going to change and construction is going to start being one thing to somebody on one side of town yeah and a very different thing yep. to people in the neighborhood that are yeah, uh, the uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So if, they, if there's a communication put out there, I you know I'm on the Facebook page yeah. today. Yeah, so am I. Yeah, Nelson's in the yeah, neighborhood too. Yeah. So you you got the guy running the project and the guy yeah. that can make noise right there, right around. <laughs> We're good. Anything else from council? Yeah, I think we have questions. Excellent. Well, we, we thank you very much for engaging with us tonight, asking questions, all the information and conversation for those online as well. Thank you very much for sticking with us. So not that 20 after seven. I think that's pretty good. So again, if you have questions, anything pops up after the fact, please by all means contact us using that contact form. We'll get an answer to you as quickly as we can. All right. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your evening.